how realistic and what is the possibility, as you said, you know, reverting back to the open source licenses? Because honestly speaking, everybody, the, when we heard this news, the first thought was that this is what IBM may do or this is what IBM should do to fix some of the mistakes that were made. How realistic do you think it is? I think it's very realistic. I think IBM, you know, especially because of its you know, Red Hat, you know, it, 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 it is, you know, Red Hat is a major component here. Hi, this is your host, Abdul Bharatiya, and welcome to TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us once again, Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of Rack. And Rob, it's great to have you back on the show to discuss a very important uh, news that uh, is in progress. It's a pleasure, and it's always stunning to me how fast the news breaks and how many things, uh, how much our industry is constantly changing. Let's break the news. IBM has, you know, it's now official that they are going to where HashiCorp, just give us a recap summary of what is happening. This was rumored back in March, and it looks like the rumors were true. Uh, HashiCorp was had been looking for a buyer. Uh, that's part of this this broader story, um, and IBM stepped in as that buyer. Um, and what we've seen in this that's very clear is um, it's a really interesting opportunity in which a company of IBM size steps in to acquire. Um, a company that has really been seen as a core tools provider for cloud infrastructure. Uh, that um, uh, acquisition looks official and correct. Um, one thing to note is that the, that there's a pretty significant discount on the stock price. It's a cash purchase from where uh, HashiCorp IPO'd. Um, it was an $80 IPO and a $36 uh, per share acquisition price. So. Um, you know, facts like that are material when we start talking about rationale and, and what's happening and, and you know what who's acting and, and why. Why do you feel that IBM is making this acquisition? It's unclear. Uh, you know, the the press release and the material that came out was was pretty vague. Um, almost felt intentionally vague. Um, and and I've heard a lot of different theories. Everything from it was a great bargain. Um, which it reflects the, the the share price and, and the assets that IBM could acquire. To you know, IBM has a real vision for how they're going to become a hybrid cloud powerhouse, and you know, one of the the, the crown jewels of hybrid cloud automation is the HashiCorp suite of products. I've also heard um, some ideas of HashiCorp's license change, which we've talked about uh, quite a bit, because could actually have contributed to IBM having some products that were blocked. Um, Terraform, there's a there's been a fork of that called Open Tofu, but other products that they have that are actually more profitable, like Vault, um, were embedded in products that a lot of companies have, including IBM. And so acquiring these assets um, potentially unblocks uh, competitive or standalone products that IBM might have wanted to offer. So quite a range of potential motivations. And like anything, there's probably a degree of truth in all of them. How is this acquisition different from Red Hat's acquisition? Red Hat was a much, much more significant uh, asset uh, to acquire. Um, and part of the thing that was uh, attractive in the Red Hat acquisition was the leadership of the team at Red Hat. So Red Hat had some really deep credibility, real deep capabilities that IBM has um, really kept in place. I mean, there have been some changes to how Red Hat approaches uh, open source and some of their core technologies, but for the most part, Red Hat has operated as a very standalone company. Um, it doesn't appear that that is going to be the case here. Uh, we haven't had those types of assurances. Those were given on day one uh, with the Red Hat uh, acquisition, with the HashiCorp acquisition, they, they really don't have the same type of um, deep expertise across their organization. It's a very talented organization, don't get me wrong. I, I, I have a lot of respect for the HashiCorp engineers and leadership, but it hasn't um, had the time or built the reputation, especially with their open source license changes um, that the Red Hat team had and, and felt necessary to protect. Um, and it is worth noting here that the acquisition is by IBM not Red Hat. Um, and they keep those two companies separate enough that Red Hat could make acquisitions as Red Hat and IBM can make acquisitions as IBM. Um, and that's going to be a very interesting angle as we learn how much of this is um, inter impacted or uh, triangulated with Red Hat versus how much is really an IBM 
decision as it as its operating entity. And there may be a lot of speculation at this point, but how do you see IBM is going to operate or run HashiCorp? Red Hat still runs as a separate, you know, company in itself, you know. Uh, IBM is seen as a partner and a client, as same as with Red Hat is seen as a partner and client and IBM continues to work with, uh, which may be seen as traditional competitors of Red Hat, uh, same thing, Red Hat continues to work with a lot of players that can be seen as a competitor of Red Hat. But what is going to be the case with the HashiCorp? Oh boy, this is where the speculation really starts to run run wild and hot in, in this case. Uh, let me let me establish some things that I think are, are pretty straightforward factually. Uh, HashiCorp has products that are competitive to other IBM offerings, and they're going to have to reconcile that. So, for example, HashiCorp Nomad is uh, competitive to Kubernetes, which in Red Hat's parlance they call OpenShift. Their variation of it, and so those are those that that competitive element is going to have to be stacked up. Um, the Vault technology set is as an underpinning is an important piece, um, and that potentially has competitive aspects within what IBM is trying to bring to market. The other one that's interesting is Red Hat has a platform called Ansible Automation Platform that has been embedding more and more types of automation that would compete with HashiCorp Cloud Platform (HCP) um, built into the Terraform pieces. That was part of the license piece where um, they forked. Ter- Terraform and created Open Tofu. One of the things that's fascinating here is there's an opportunity for IBM to reverse some of those licensing, some or all of those licensing discussions, and move Terraform back into purely open source, fold it into Open Tofu, um, or bring Tofu back into the Terraform uh, ranks as part of the governance for that project. Um, so it's it's really not clear at this point, how they want to pull these things together. One of the things that I believe uh, HashiCorp was getting beaten up for in the market was they really hadn't been able to take all of these tools, they have amazing tools, but build them into a more unified uh, platform, into a unified offering. Um, That's an incredibly hard thing to do. It's part of what what RackN builds as our our platform, is this idea of of a unified infrastructure automation platform. And it's one of the things that we've been watching to see HashiCorp trying to take these individually powerful tools and then build them into a comprehensive suite. Um, it's not clear at the moment if IBM has a strategy for that. They, they you know, I, I think in market, the market wants to see that. We've been waiting to see if HashiCorp would, would adopt it. Um, and so how IBM chooses to absorb the the, the product and the team, whether they see something in HashiCorp that is a unified vision and they can adopt it, or if they just see it as a bunch of parts um, that they are then going to pull into IBM efforts is something that you know we're watching eagerly. I tend to believe that um, you know they, they since they they got a lot of this great IP and and people at a relatively good price from IBM's perspective that the value for them is going to be treating it as um, a, what I would call a string of pearls, where you're you're taking the individual projects and pieces, you're pulling them into IBM's broader market. Um, one thing that they were pretty clear about is this continues to be part of IBM's strategy to be a hybrid cloud powerhouse. Um, and I think that is one of the places where IBM has really been looking to establish more market credibility since they're not one of the major cloud providers their ability to easily navigate customers between those clouds is is probably one of their their larger assets at this point. Their neutrality, um, and when it comes to cloud neutrality, HashiCorp is really um, you know the top name in that in that story. How do you see this development from the perspective of Rackn or Hashi's whole ecosystem vendors customers? It's definitely going to be welcome, assuming I think a lot of people are going to make the assumption that at least Terraform is going to be moved back into the into the open license, and so um, Hashi being taken off the field as a as a standalone competitor means that the people who were embedding Terraform as a core part of their business probably just got a six to 12 month, maybe 18 month reprieve in in development efforts. So the the, the field of what we would what I would call a taco, what's generally known as a Terraform application, uh, coordination and orchestration, there's different people use that, define that acronym differently, but, but Terraform orchestrators 
as a whole probably have a breath of fresh air to work on their products a little bit more because of the disruption that's going to be caused by this acquisition. Even better if Terraform moves back into the open source and we're, we're back to not having to compete with uh, HashiCorp uh, and OpenTofu as, as divergent projects. Uh, that's a pretty significant thing. I think a lot of other components for this are not particularly worrisome for people. Uh, you know, people who've embedded the open source Terraform and HashiCorp products, Vault and uh, Console, things like that, they, they should be looking, they should be pretty comfortable that they're going to be able to continue to maintain access to that those products. Uh, potentially even welcome the license being opened up. Although I don't expect IBM is going to open up or reopen all of the licenses that got closed. One thing that I think if you're a Nomad user, uh, you probably have to be scratching your head about what the future of Nomad is. Um, and that could easily be something that ends up being a standalone company that takes over Nomad or does consulting against Nomad. Um, I, I do expect uh, IBM to rally around Kubernetes uh, more aggressively. How realistic and what is the possibility, as you said, you know, reverting back to the open source licenses? Because honestly speaking, everybody, the, when we heard this news, the first thought was that this is what IBM may do or this is what IBM should do to fix some of the mistakes that were made. How realistic do you think it is? I think it's very realistic. I think IBM, you know, especially because of its you know, red hat you know, it, 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 it is, you know, Red Hat is a major component here. Um, I think it would be very hard for them to um, take products that they're using, uh, which, and they are using Terraform and embedding it in several of their other products to, to not turn that back into an open source piece. It would, it would be a challenge from a significant portion of the IBM family, meaning the, the Red Hat engineers. Um, and I, I don't think that IBM has the same level of concerns that HashiCorp had from a license selling, you know, a licensed software perspective. They're not, you know, IBM has a very broad portfolio. They make a lot of consulting revenue. They sell a lot of consulting. Consulting is a core part of their business. And therefore, they, they don't get penalized in the same way that, you know, pure play standalone like HashiCorp was, um, has to be a software or a SaaS revenue driven business to get the multiples they need to in the market. So I think it does take a lot of pressure off the licensing piece. Uh, you know, our experience has been that it is very difficult to monetize open source. So we've seen this uh, both from Racken's history, but also from the market as a whole. There are certain types of operations um, that make are difficult to open source and then maintain from um, a collaboration perspective. Once you get inside a, a company's operational environment and you start having to create repeatable operations, reusable code, reusable automation, that those types of, of that virtuous cycle can be very hard to maintain as a purely open source uh, product. IBM doesn't have that problem. They're operating as a consulting company with a lot of enterprise connections, and they have, they have a different go-to-market than HashiCorp does. Thank you. Now, I want to also know, what does it mean for Racken? What Racken does here is we build an integrated automation platform, and our primary goal is actually to reduce sprawl. So we we not only have our platform, Digital Rebar, but the automation and the 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 infrastructure pipelines that are delivered as part of that infrastructure as code system are designed to be reused customer to customer across the board. And that we've seen with customers provides incredibly high ROIs. It's sort of the holy grail of building automation to be able to share, reuse, modularize the automation so that it can be applied uh, consistently within customers, but also consistently across customers. And one of the things that we've seen as an opportunity in this market is that ability to not just build you know, individual tools like Terraform or Ansible, but to actually come to customers with a consistent, repeatable way to scale those operations across their organization. The, the challenge with something like that and what we've seen um, here, and maybe IBM has some ideas on it, or maybe IBM's walking back into this, this challenge that HashiCorp wasn't able to solve, is you have to be able to pull people from team by team decision makings, highly independent autonomous units inside of an organization into a place where those companies are sharing, reusing, and collaborating. 
um, which is really a platform statement. It's a platform, what we would call infrastructure platform engineering um, or infrastructure platforms in general. We see this as still an unsolved problem in the industry. It's something that RackN and Digital Rebar solves in a very unique way across our customer base. We haven't seen other companies been be able to take as um, broad an approach here. What I saw HashiCorp being pulled by the market to do is address those types of concerns. And one of the things that we saw them doing was is really not being able to pull together that unified vision. Um, we are very excited to continue to, to solve that problem in market. We're excited to see the demand for that because I think HashiCorp really demonstrated that there's a, a consumer enterprise demand for integrated solutions that are reusable and reduce toil and improve collaboration. So for, for our perspective, this hasn't really changed the market particularly much. Um, we don't expect IBM to, to you know, with make it harder to access these these core technologies. As a matter of fact, what we act, what we see is potentially addressing some of the market angst around what HashiCorp would do with the license and pulling it back into more community products, building up that open source space that everybody wants to build their infrastructure around. Rob, once again, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this development. Uh, thanks for great insights and as usual, I look. And as usual, I about the, and as usual, I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Swap. I appreciate the time. I'm looking forward to our next breaking news event.